for 10 years, at one stage in my life, I was the very frustrated owner of a Suzuki 185 trail bike. <laughs> it was at a time when I was living in a mission in Kenya called Cabernet. And Cabernet was right on the edge of the escarpment. There was literally a 5,000 foot drop down into the Kerio Valley. And then the Kerio Valley was about 15 miles wide. And there was a 5,000 5, feet climb at this, the far side of the valley. And I had this motorbike, a Suzuki 185 trail bike. If you, I don't know if you know anything about motorbikes. A trail bike is an off-road motorbike in which the mudguard, if this is the wheel here, the mudguard is up like about here because you're getting a lot of spring because you're off-road constantly. And this thing got me to places which I shouldn't have gotten to. <laughs> and it got me stuck in a lot of places I shouldn't have gotten stuck in. It was the bane of my life. Now, I am useless around motor cars or motorbikes. I don't know anything about them. I know how to drive them. I know nothing about what, what goes on with them. And so one day, I'm in the middle of the Carrier Valley, and the Carrier Valley is a desert. And the thing breaks down again, not for the third time or the tenth time or the hundredth time. And I'm sitting at the side of the track. There's not even a road. There's a track there. And this is a track that, if you're lucky, there may be a car pass or a truck pass twice a week. <laughs> I'm stuck probably 35 miles from home at this stage. I'm sitting down, I've taken off my helmet, and I'm cursing fluently in several languages. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and under the horizon, I can see this figure bobbing along. And there's this guy coming towards me. And he's an, an Ingems. The Ingems were a tribe who live in the Kerry Valley. They're related to the Maasai. And like the tribesmen in the area, he always carries his spear across his shoulder with his hands dangling over it. He's got his cloak on him, and he's got shoes which are made from car tires, and he's got a gourd of mursik. I've talked to you, talked to you about mursik before. Mursik was the, the drink of the Kalenjin. It was all the vital juices of the camel. It was the blood of the camel, and the milk of the camel, and the urine of the camel, all mixed together with charcoal powder. And it was pff, yummy. <laughs> I tried looking for it in Whole Foods when I came here, and <laughs> couldn't have it. So there he is, ambling along with his spear, and his gourd of mursik and his sandals. And I can see him coming, and I know exactly what's going to happen. And I'm in foul humor. So I try to ignore him. So he comes right up in front of me. Abarigani. Literally, what's the news? And I say, Missouri. Which literally means fine. Yeah. But I wasn't feeling a bit fine. But you have to say fine in Swahili. You have to say Missouri. Dead silence. So he looks at the motorbike, and he says, in Maharabika? Is it broken? <laughs> and I'm thinking in my mind, no, I'm just sitting here at the side of the road in 125 degree temperatures just for the sheer hell of it. <laughs> I ignore him. He looks at it again for a few minutes and he says, Pengine ni carburetor. Perhaps it's the carburetor. <laughs> now, he wouldn't recognize a carburetor from a bar of soap, and neither would I. <laughs> and he may have been right because there was so much dust in the place that the dust got into everything. He may have been right, but he didn't know that, and I didn't know that. And he's just saying it because he heard the word carburetor someplace, and it sounded like a nice word, and he learned it, and he was going to use it. <laughs> so I totally ignore him. There's nothing worse than being stuck with a broken down machine and have somebody ask you about it. So as a sidebar here, totally unsolicited, I'm going to give really important advice to all the women. If you're out with your husband driving a car, and you've got your kids in the back of the car, and the car breaks down, and he pops the hood, and he puts his head under the hood, and three or four natives come out, and they're looking under the hood, the exact worst thing that can happen for your husband or the men is for the wife to come around and say, what's wrong? <laughs> can you fix it? <laughs> what's not working? Because the guys have to pretend that they know exactly what they're looking for. And most of them don't even know what they're looking at. <laughs> but this is male bonding. And it is really humiliating for a woman to come up and start asking questions which unveil their ignorance. So don't ever do it. If your husband has his head under the bonnet of a car and there are others around, do not ask him if it's broken or if he can fix it or should you phone for a real, a real man <laughs> and fix it for him. So that's how I'm feeling, sitting at the side of the road, with this dude with his spear asking me, is it the carburetor? <laughs> now, that's the story that comes to mind every time I read this reading from John's Gospel, the end of John's Gospel, of Jesus standing on the shore, a carpenter, asking a bunch of professional fishermen 
Huh, I see you didn't catch any fish. What's up, dudes? <laughs> so you can imagine the interaction between them. So that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to make four main points today. The first one I will call the interaction. Through this, I just make associations myself. Then the second point I call this symbolism. And then thirdly, I'll talk about the ordination. And then fourthly, about the Eucharist. So I'm just going to walk myself through this instance. It's a beautiful little story and just free associate to the elements of it. And the first thing that comes up for me is this. At the very beginning of the story, as they're standing around wondering what to do, I ask myself the question, what did happen when Jesus died? So after three days or four days, what were the disciples doing? Now, we kind of think, we telescope 2,000 years of history, and we all imagine, oh, there was this seamless transition. They got together, they broke up into small little groups, and they discussed what they were going to do. And somebody says, well, we obviously, we got to found a new religion. That's what we need to do, a new religion. So he says, well, what a great idea. Well, I'm, yeah, count me in. So what are we going to call it? And somebody says, um, how about, like, companions on the journey? <laughs> and so he says, no, 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 I checked it out in the, on the web. That's taken already. <laughs> and somebody says, well, how about, like, how about the Roman Catholic Church? And say, wow, right on, dude, that's it. That's it, that's it. That's from the Roman Catholic Church. And how we do it? Well, I figure, like, we need a central character. We'll call him the Pope. And um, he'd be infallible. And we'll have cardinals, and we'll have archbishops, and we'll have bishops, and we'll have priests, and then we'll have the laity at the bottom. And we'll, have, we'll create laws, and we'll make sins, and we'll have crusades, and inquisitions. Whoa, things are looking up. <laughs> Do we really think that that's how they spent a few weeks after Jesus disappeared? They had no idea what was up. They were hanging around, they were really upset, totally despondent, and so what did they do? What any one of us would do. We'd go back to doing what we'd always done. We're fishermen, let's go back and go fishing. They had no intention whatsoever of starting a new movement or a new church. They had no idea what had happened to Jesus. It seemed like all their dreams were gone, and now, well, the dream is blown, so let's go back fishing. We know how to fish, at least let's go back fishing. So that was the first association that comes to me. They weren't, they were going fishing because there was nothing else to do except go fishing. And then they're out there and they're working all night and they're really frustrated and they catch nothing. And then this guy on the shore says, did you catch anything? I can see there's nothing in your boat. It's really riding high in the waves, so there's obviously no weight in it. And their answer to it, if you were listening, was, did you catch anything? The answer is, no. It wasn't, no, we didn't catch anything. We were kind of frustrated. We've been out here all night. It was a single monosyllabic, no. Butt out, mind your own business. That's the tone of it, because they're really tired and they're frustrated. And then he goes on and he says, how about you cast your net to the right side of the boat? Maybe you'll catch something there. Now this seems like another interference. This seems like your wife again telling you, maybe it's the carburetor. But in actual fact, it was actually common practice in that area on the Sea of Galilee. There were kind of cliffs around some sides of it and bluffs. And sometimes if a boat is offshore, Somebody standing on the land, elevated a little bit, maybe up on a 50 meter rise, actually has a much better idea of what's around the boat. And so you can see stuff from that distance or from that elevation that you can't see at the level of the water itself. So in fact, it wasn't, a, it wasn't uncommon for people on the shore to stand up and say, yeah, I can see, you've got seaweed on your, on your left and you've got a shoal of fish on your right. And so they accept it. He can see stuff they can't see because he's elevated and he's much more distance from it. And they do it. They throw their nets to the right side of the boat and they catch this extraordinary catch of fish. That's the second association. The third piece then is Peter is making his last valiant attempt to win the Darwin Award. Do you know the Darwin Award? There's an award given every year for people who do the dumbest things on the planet. And the award is to try to keep them out of the gene pool so they don't breed. Peter was definitely making an attempt for the Darwin Award. He's inside in the boat, he's stripped naked, and then somebody says, oh my God, it's Jesus, it's the master. And what does Peter do? Puts on his clothes and throws himself into the water. <laughs> now the interesting thing, the translation says, he didn't dive into the water, and he didn't even jump into the water. He threw himself into the water. When you, wh what is this about? It wasn't just craziness. When you look at the level of passion that's involved in that act. The extraordinary, enthusiastic passion that Jesus is back. The nearest thing I can describe to it is this. 
I was very close to my grandfather. He died when I was 10 years of age. I call him Daddy Jim. It's the greatest, he was a druid and the greatest storyteller I've ever come across. I was really, really close to him. And in the 50 odd years since he died, he died in December 1956, on about eight occasions, I've had really, really powerful dreams, which were so real that I was totally convinced he was alive again. And in each of the dreams, I would say to him, Daddy Jim, I thought you were dead. I can't believe it. And I'd rush at him and give him this bear, bear hug. And then I'd wake up and I would be devastated, absolutely devastated. It feels to me something like this was happening for Peter, that Jesus was gone. And all of a sudden, here he is on the beach, and he can't wait for the guys to row the boat ashore, and he throws himself, literally, he didn't jump, didn't dive, he just threw himself into the water and swam ashore as fast as he could. What if we could drum up that level of passion and enthusiasm for Christ consciousness? Of all the disciples of Jesus, I only see that level of passionate, absolute passionate embrace of Jesus in two characters. One is Mary of Magdala. In one of the accounts of the resurrection, she fires herself at Jesus when she recognizes him, and she clings to him. And he has to say, you know, you have to back off a little bit. You know, I still haven't descended to my father. Go and tell my brothers and my sisters that I am arisen. That level of passionate clinging. And it's not so much wanting to cling to the physical articulation of stuff. It's a deep soul connection. It's a soul bonding, what we call in my language an anam chara, a soul friend, that you recognize that level of attachment to you, between your soul and the soul of somebody else. And Peter was feeling this, obviously, and Mary of Magdala felt that. And that accounts for the craziness of his action. Naked as he was, he throws on his clothes and then throws himself overboard and swims up. And I can imagine him rushing up the beach and giving Jesus this big grizzly bear hug. And you really think that Jesus, oh my God, you're all wet, leave me alone. <laughs> Jesus pa hugged him as passionately as Peter hugged him. Because at the end of this story, it's not contained in today's version, at the end of this story, Jesus will give Peter three chances to undo his three denials of him. And then he will give him his final commissioning. And so this is a story filled with extraordinary passion. Maybe for the first time in his life, for the first time in all the years he'd known Jesus, for the first time, G Peter got who Jesus was. They made a soul connection. Jesus had always seen who Peter was. This was the first time that Peter had seen who Jesus was. And he throws himself passionately into this new mission of himself. And then Christ sends him back into the boat to get some more fish and to have breakfast together. Now, the, the association with that for me is this. Again, as a, as a child, um, we had a little seaside cottage in a place called Gailleen on the south coast of Ireland, and we would spend the summer months down there. It was just a little thatched cottage. And during the summer months, occasionally, the mackerel would shoal. I know if you've ever seen mackerel shoaling. Mackerel shoal, and there are literally tens of thousands of them racing through the water following the sprites. The sprites are tiny, tiny little fish that jump out of the water. And there's hundreds of thousands of those. And the mackerel just go right after them, crazy, 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 rushing. And they come right up near the beach. And as little kids, we would get buckets with holes in them and literally just wade into the water, waist high, and take a bucket and sieve it through the water, and you'd come out with five or six mackerel riding around the side of the bucket. That's how densely packed they were. And then we'd go, go up home, cut the heads off them, cut the tails off them, take the spine out of it, put uh, flour on it, and put it in a pan with butter and throw them in. And within 20 minutes of taking them out of the ocean, you'd be eating mackerel. I imagine that that's what it was like this morning. You had these really, really, really fresh fish, literally just caught and now charcoal grilled. Imagine that's the great taste of food that you eat outside. So the bonding that was happening for this little group was awesome. The emotional connecting and the soul correspondence that was happening here is absolutely awesome. So that's my first point. There are some of the kind of associations that come up for me. My second point then is the symbolism of all this, because not only is this a truly great story that grips our minds, our imaginations, and our souls, it also goes really, really deep to the mystical core of Jesus' teaching. So just to take a few of the symbols. Why, what's important about the fish piece here? As you know, the fish will in fact become the first great Christian symbol. For the first 400 years before the cross becomes the symbol, the fish is the symbol of Christianity. Now, why would that be? Do you think it's because most of the first 12 were fishermen, and they're thinking, oh, we need some kind of a logo. <laughs> what do we do? Triangle? Nah. Um, cross? Nah. How about a fish? You know, eight of us are fishermen. Let's, let's do a fish. 
So they create the fish as a logo. Was that why it happened? Or was it because in the great scheme of things, in 2,000 year chunks, as the astrological signs change, they're coming into the time of Pisces, the sign of the fish, is that why they chose it? Or was it because that there was a phrase which became current very, very quickly, Jesus Christus Theus hux so, hus Soter, a Greek phrase meaning Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And if you take the first letters of those words in Greek, they spell the word ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish. We get the English word ichthyology, the study of fish, from that. And so that's probably the explanation. It comes from this great phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, in Greek. They take the first letter of each word, and this becomes the sacred symbol. But much more importantly than that for me, it's the deep symbolism that fish are the denizens of the deep. Fish are the archetypes of the collective unconscious, to use Jungian kind of languages. And therefore, when we dig deeply into the collective unconsciousness, we unearth all of the great archetypes which have informed all humans searching for the transcendent in the last 50,000 years of our life. So the fisherman is the person who delves deeply into the collective unconscious and brings these archetypes to the surface. So that's why the fish is such an important symbol here. And the ocean itself, the ocean is both the collective unconscious, which is the repository of all human wisdom. I told you one time that I had a friend, Seamus Odalerga, who was an, a folklorist, who told me that there are 120 basic motifs that happen again and again and again in all the great mythologies of planet Earth. They're dressed differently in different traditions, but they're just basically about 120 of them. These are the fish that swim in the ocean of the collective unconscious. So fishing is a deep mystical exercise where you unearth these great archetypes of the human collective. That's why it's important. And the ocean is the repository of that. Now the ocean can have totally antithetical meanings. It can mean mindlessness, because to the extent that something is in the unconscious and we don't have access to it, then we can't utilize it or benefit from it. But the invitation is to dig in there and to make it mindful. And that's the meaning of the phrase that we use in our Eucharistic prayer, where we say, God, you are the ocean, bathing in the waters of your own awareness. We are the fish, agreeing that we can feel the wetness, but demanding proof that the ocean exists. And so for most of us, we're all in the ocean, but for most of us, the only part of the ocean we experience is the little piece of water that surrounds us. And we can agree, yeah, it's wet, but that doesn't prove there's an ocean out there. I just see this little piece of water around me, whereas God bathes in the entire ocean of total mindfulness. And the invitation for us is to go to the same place, to come into the ocean of total mindfulness, the unity consciousness which connects us to everything else. There's a second symbol. And the third symbol would be, why did he tell him, throw it to the right side? Now obviously Christ isn't a fisherman. He wouldn't have used the term left or right. He would have used port or starboard, because a fisherman would use that. So why did he use right or left? In many, many, many languages, the word right has very, very interesting connotations, and the word left has very different connotations. So for instance, in, Engli in English, when we say the right, we don't just mean the piece on this side of my body. Right means correct or proper. And left has kind of negative connotations. And this is true in so many different languages. Like in French, for instance, it's adroit and gauche, like it's awkward on the left, adroit on the right-hand side. In my language, in Gaelic, we call this un love das, which also means the nice hand. In Swahili, this one is called mkona wakume, which literally means the male hand, and male is always superior to female. In the Kalenjin languages, this hand is called iutaptai, which means the first hand or the primary hand. So in many different systems, this side is special and the other side isn't, isn't good. And so to throw the net to the right side of the boat, it means you have to know what you're doing when you're fishing, not just fishing for fish, but when you're fishing for souls. You have to know what you're doing. You can't just go out and proselytize. You can't become like a Mormon or somebody who goes out and sticks leaflets under your door and tries you know, bludgeon you into a discussion of religion. That is not what it's about. It's knowing what is the appropriate time to speak to whom in what kinds of tones about what. It's very important to know how to fish. And Jesus will say this many, many times. He will say, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Another time, if you don't mind me mixing my uh, metaphors here, he would say, do not throw, do not cast your pearls before swine. 
And this is not any kind of a hierarchical justification, is that there are people who are ready for different levels of message. There are people who, when they encounter religion, will be able to unpack it only at a fundamentalist, literalist level. That's the best they can do. Good luck to them. There are other people who, when they meet religion, they're able to unpack it at a symbolical level. Good luck to them. And then there are people who can meet it and they can unpack it at a deep mystical level. And Christ is saying, the person who has ears to hear, let them hear. Whatever your ears are capable of hearing, that's what you need to hear. So depending where you are in your journey, it'll be a literalist, fundamentalist interpretation, or it'll be a symbolic interpretation, or it'll be a deep mystical interpretation. But you have to know where to fish. And this is the whole meaning. We've been using the Gnostic scriptures here for the last seven or eight weeks during Lent. And this is the entire meaning of Gnosticism, that there is a deeper way of knowing, which is not just an intellectual appreciation of, or the, the physical kind of cognition of. It's about a deep, deep resonance between the soul of the reading and the soul of the reader. And that's what Gnosticism basically is about. Learning to listen to scriptures at a totally different level because they're organic, they move as you move. As you move from fundamentalism to symbolism to mysticism, the scripture tradition moves with you and sustains you at those levels. So that's some of the kind of the, the symbolic interpretations, which is my second point. My third point then, I would call it the ordination. So I'm watching these eight people, seven disciples and Jesus, sitting around the campfire on the early morning, the mist is just beginning to, to lift, and they're having a great time with it. The food tastes really, really good. But before they, they finish cooking, Christ says to Peter, go back into the boat and take some of the fish that you caught, because he only had maybe one or two fish right there, and there's eight guys. So they take their own fish, and they cook both. They cook the fish that Jesus has already caught, and they cook the stuff that they've caught themselves. What does this mean? For me, this is the handing on of the baton. This is Jesus, in fact, for me, this is ordination. This is where the guys got ordained, because a true priest is somebody who fishes and feeds. There are two functions to priesthood. It is fishing and it is feeding. The fishing is the male aspect of priesthood and the feeding is the female aspect of priesthood and both of them are vital. You can't have one without the other. You cannot be a true priest without doing both. And I don't mean priest in, a, in an ordained sense of the word. I mean to be truly on the path toward enlightenment in order to feed other souls in your journey. You have to be a fisher and you've got to be a feeder. And so what is the fisher? The fisher is the person who's out there looking, seeking, studying, meditating, trying to come into contact with the deeper mysteries. And then the feeder is the person who has been nourished themselves and want to share this nourishment with others. And Christ is doing that today. He's passing on the baton. He could have obviously gotten enough fish to feed all of them. He chose not to do that. He wanted them to feed on their own fishing. He was passing the baton. His job was finished on planet Earth for that incarnation, and now it was their chance to do it, and this was priesthood for them. And they got to step up to the wicked and realize now that they would become the fishers and they would become the feeders. And that would be the male aspect of priesthood and the female aspect of priesthood. And now what does the net represent? The interesting thing is there was 153 fish in the net. Now what does that number mean? At the time that this was written, Greek zoology, the taxonomy of Greek zoology claimed that there were 153 species of fish on the planet. So what they were saying actually was he caught one of each species of fish. And this obviously is highly symbolic. So this is not a mathematical number, it's a zoological number. It was the number of species of fish believed by the Greeks to exist on planet Earth. And so when they hauled in their, their nets, they had one fish of each species. What does that say to me? It says that the kingdom of God, which is the net, the community, is able to hold everybody. Now, we know there's a lot more than 153 species of fish at this stage, and there are many more tribes of people. The kingdom of God, the net, which represents the community of Christ consciousness, is able to hold all of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the fundamentalists, the symbologists, and the mystics. We're all being held in the same net. And we were told that although there are so many, the net did not tear which was amazing, nets tore a lot. With that kind of a weight of fish, they would be capable of rending a sun. They didn't tear, and what's the symbolism for that? No matter how many of us are on planet Earth, of how many tribes, of how many religions, of how many persuasions, of how many nations, of how many religions, there is only one net, there is only one community. In fact, this net 
is just not holding 193 nations of the United Nations. It's not just holding the 25 or 30 great religions of the planet. It's not just holding the 7,000 different cultures of the planet. It's not just holding all human beings. It's, hu it's holding all sentient life. Everything is contained in this net. The kingdom of God is not about Roman Catholicism. It's not about monotheism. It is not about religion or spirituality. It is not even about human beings. It is about all of life. Everything is held in the kingdom of God. And the net does not break. In spite of our best efforts to rend it, and we have really, really tried. We have tried through excommunication. We've tried through ethnocide. We've tried through violence. We've tried through crusades. You cannot rend the net. There is only one life being lived through all of us and by all of us. And that net is capable of holding all kinds of diversity. So that's what I mean by ordination. And my final point then, Eucharist. It's interesting that in John's Gospel, and John claims to be the beloved disciple, the one closest to Jesus. Only in John's Gospel of the four canonical Gospels, only in John's Gospel is there no account of the institution of Eucharist. John devotes a large section of his Gospel to the Last Supper, but there is no mention of the institution of Eucharist in John's Gospel at the Last Supper. Except when you look very, very closely and you know where to look and how to look, there are two accounts of Eucharist in John's Gospel, but they're hidden. One is in chapter 6, and the other one is in chapter 21. And that had to do with feeding. The first one was feeding 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. And there's always, a, there's always a clue. There's a Eucharistic code, and the Eucharistic code is this. He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives just a bit. When you see those four words together, you know you're in the presence of a Eucharistic encounter. So although in John's Gospel, there's no formal mention of the institution of Eucharist, there are two great stories in which he's celebrating Eucharist. Except in both, both times, John doesn't use bread and wine, he uses bread and fish. Maybe he, was in, maybe he was in AA or something, he didn't want wine around. But in John's Eucharist, it's always bread and fish. It's not bread and wine, it's bread and fish each time. And the first story, he feeds 5,000 people with the, the, the five loaves and the two fishes. And the second instance, he's feeding himself and seven others with fish and bread, the same thing. So there are two accounts of Eucharist. But when you look at this extraordinary code, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it. And I've ex exegeted this view many, many times. What does it mean to take bread from the planet? It doesn't mean to grab it. It doesn't mean to rape the earth in the process. It means to gratefully accept from our mother Gaia what she's been offering us for 4.5 billion years. It is to accept lovingly and graciously the foodstuff that our, mother's, that our mother offers to us. So we take it with gratitude. We don't grab it. And the second thing, we bless it. Now, I said to you many times that blessing is not about the infusion of benediction into a previously inert substance. Every substance is already blessed. It is the recognition of the blessedness of the bread that's what the bless means. It's not that I do this over a piece of bread and suddenly now it's different. It has a different kind of energy. It is that I recognize the inherent blessedness of it. The blessing is a recognition, not an imparting. And the third piece is he breaks it. What is this about? This is trying to create models of life in human, on, uh, models of life on the planet which are about justice. Trying to create economic models where everybody is factored in to the feeding. And the, f the final piece then is he gave it to them. And I want to just emphasize this for a little bit. In today's story, he didn't just give it to some of them, he gave it to all of them. In the story in John's Gospel in chapter 6, he didn't just give it to some of the 5,000, he gave it to all of the 5,000. Why am I emphasizing this? Because the Christian church and the Roman Catholic church particularly has made Eucharist the yardstick of exclusivity. If you're not in communion with Rome, you don't get to, part to, to eat communion with us. If you're divorced and remarried, you don't get to eat communion with us. If you're a gay person and you're practicing love in a gay lifestyle, you don't get to eat with the rest of us. And so we exclude all these kinds of people. If you're a sinner in mortal sin and you didn't go to confession last night, you can't receive with us today. Did, did Jesus say any of these things? Do you not realize that when he fed the 5,000 people, there were probably a lot of divorced people in his audience. Judaism was practiced. Uh, divorce was widely practiced in Judaism. 
There were lots of divorced people in Jesus' audience. He didn't say, um, anybody divorced, I want you to go over to the left there, you can't receive the stuff. And in that audience, there was obviously, there were a, a human community, 10% of that community is gay. He didn't say, I don't want any, uh, any kind of uh, gay guys here, I want the gay guys way over on the right there someplace else, you know, I want to get the straight people here in the middle. And he didn't say, uh, anybody who's not in communion with Rome, out, I can only feed those who are in communion with Rome. Who was in communion with Rome at that stage? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody was in communion with Rome at that stage. And if you're a sinner and you can't receive, how many of his audience were sinners, technically sinners? According to the religion of their own belief and the religion of Jesus, many of those were sinners, according to Jewish law, for various infractions of Torah, of all 613 precepts. He didn't say, okay, here's the deal, guys. I'm going to feed everybody who's not divorced and remarried, who's in communion with Rome, who's not gay, and who's not, who didn't not go to confession last night. Anybody left? And he's feeding himself. He didn't do that. But unfortunately, we have taken this extraordinary sacrament of total inclusivity, and we've, we've confined it to a, just a small subgroup. Eucharist is not the sacrament for those who are on the straight and narrow path. It is not even the sacrament for all human beings. It is the sacrament for our planet. Eucharist is a sacrament whereby every sentient being on planet Earth gets invited to the banquet of God's largesse.